Welcome to the Candidates Night, sponsored by James A. McKee Association. I'm Don Hollister, the association president. Tonight, Jerry Sutton will be our moderator, and I'll turn it over right away. Okay, I'm Jerry Sutton, as he said, and the volunteer moderator. So, uh, the James A. McKee Association thanks you all for coming tonight and congratulates the candidates for their willingness to put themselves forward. Our participatory democracy is built on the willingness of citizens to volunteer to soldier shoulder civic responsibilities and hold office of trust. Please join me in thanking tonight's candidates for their initiative. We also should give a little recognition to a few McKee members who have worked behind the scenes to make this event happen year after year. You've heard from Don Hollister already. Peggy Erskine back at the table, our treasurer and chief organizer. She sent a couple of letters to everybody that was invited to participate. She keeps track of everything. Dave Turner is our timer. Where's Dave? He usually sits there. There's Dave. And he'll keep us on schedule. And of course, Paul Abendroff over there has been our videographer for decades. I'm running out of time, he's telling me. <laughs> the program is full, so we'll keep a brisk pace and adhere to schedules, concluding the, uh, the event hopefully by 8.30. Let's review a few ground rules. These rules of engagement have been used all the time. Uh, let's see, where are we? We'll be grouping by organizations, and they will be ordered or alphabetically. Canada Gates get five minutes to introduce themselves and address the top two issues that they foresee in their office they aspire to. Uh, then following that, we'll have a series of questions. I've already garnered a few. Uh, looks like it's gonna be an interesting evening. And uh, they have one minute to answer them. If there's some ambiguity into their answer or they evade it, I may ask a follow-up question to clarify. Following presentations and the question and answers, you should all have uh, the questions in cards. If not, Peggy has cards and pencils. And raise them during the event if you get inspired and somebody will pick them up and get them to me. Candidates are given one minute to answer the questions. And I mentioned that I would follow them up. If candidates are unable to attend this evening, they're given an opportunity to send a surrogate to make the presentation, but the surrogate is not to answer questions. Alternatively, the candidate can submit a written statement. A table at the rear contains election materials, and you're welcome to take all you can. Uh, at the conclusion of the program, still, please take an opportunity to hang around, talk to the candidates, uh, thank them for their participation, and if you have any questions that I didn't get to, uh, let me know that. So the two groups tonight, a Miami ta Township Fiscal Officer and Two candidates are on, the, are on the ballot, Benjamin Crandall and Gina Gunderklein. 
would they please come forward? They will have 10 minutes for questions. And we are alphabetical, so we'll stop, start with Benjamin. Hi, it's nice to be here. Um, my name's Benjamin Crandall. I uh, grew up in this town. I um, graduated in 95 from Yale Springs High School. Uh, studied uh, music in uh, Cincinnati, and while I was there, I um, over the summers and uh, in breaks, I had a, I had a job as an assistant bookkeeper, and then after college, I worked as an accountant for the Environmental, non environmental Working Group in Washington, D.C. Um, most of my life has been engaged in kind of nonprofit social entrepreneurship efforts. I started uh, the Environmental Working Group, or uh, sorry, uh, Common Goods Network in um, Eugene when I lived out there, Eugene, Oregon. Uh, I started with a friend, uh, a gift economy social network, Kindista, uh, and I learned software development with, uh, with my co-founder in, in starting that. Uh, I've been doing investment work for most of my life, focusing on renewable energy, sustainable transportation, that kind of thing. Uh, what else is useful to know? Um, yeah, I moved back here to back home um, about a year ago to uh, take over my mom's house and uh, to, because I thought it'd be a good place to start a family. I'm engaged to a South African woman. We're in the middle of our immigration process. Should be finishing up in the next couple months, hopefully. And uh, yeah, I thought this would be a good place to raise a, raise a family. And um, when shortly after I got here or got home, uh, I, this came across my radar at this position. Um, multiple people suggested that I run. So, you know, I, I generally just kind of follow what the universe asks of me, and that's why I'm here tonight. I'm actually, uh, I've met with Gina. I think she's also a fantastic candidate, um, you know, and because I'm so involved in, actually, I'm, I'm, one thing I forgot to mention, I'm about to start grad school for a MBA program in January. So um, that'll be a online part-time thing, so I would still have time for this uh, position as well. But um, meeting with Gina, I think she's just a fantastic candidate, and uh, I'm not clear where I'm most used, most needed in the, in, in the universe right now, or in terms of my energy. So um, I think she would be also a wonderful candidate. I've met with um, Margaret Silman a few times last fall. She's the current, for those who don't know, the current fiscal officer. Uh, it's basically an accountant job, so both Gina and I have accounting experience. Um, it's not a hard job, uh, so for either of us. So in terms of uh, what is, you know, what are important things to be considering in the transition to a new fiscal officer, uh, Margaret Silliman is a little bit old school in how she's done things, so, you know, it's just some modernization, doing things with spreadsheets instead of uh, with paper and pencil and calculator, the way that Margaret tends to do things. Um, having more digital backups of everything, um, I don't think uh, a lot of, like, invoices and that kind of thing have digital copies right now, so that um, cleaning up the chart of accounts or, you know, the... Um, you know, how, how the, the buckets of money, how they are input into the system. Um, Margaret showed me around the system, so I had a sense of like how, what things look like right now. And so there, there needs to be a little cleanup of, of the system, but these are all like fairly simple things. Um, so in terms of like what needs, what, what are pressing issues, like it's not a, a, a political, really a political, office, so there aren't really political decisions that need to be made. It's just showing up and making sure that the bills get paid. Um, and so, yeah, I think either of us is well qualified to do that. Um, one minute. I don't actually think I have much more to say. I think that's most of, you know, what, what I'm here for. I'm, in general, my philosophy is like whatever's for the greatest good. And um, that's what I'm focused on, my MBA studies on, is I'm starting a business trying to uh, provide a holistic solution to high food, healthcare, and housing costs. Uh, it's gonna be a number of years to get that business off the ground, um, and I thought this would be a good way to spend a few years in the interim as a part-time job while I was doing that. Uh, and 
yeah, so I, I feel, um, you know, I'd be happy to take this job if, if you all elect me, and I would be happy to support Gina in this role if you elect her, um, and I just, you know, want whatever is best. So that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Gina Gunderklein. Thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, as he said, uh, we met, um, and sounds like he's working on um, some wonderful things. So um, I'm excited to see where that takes him. And um, thank you to the James McKee Association for these important events and opportunities for community engagement, to Mr. Jerry Sutton for graciously moderating, um, and everyone in the audience and at home. I watched the school board uh, candidates last night from the comfort of my couch. So thank you, technology. Uh, and everyone who's been supportive of me thus far. Really appreciate the encouragement. Um, last year, I was encouraged by several members of the community to look into the fiscal officer job when it became known that Margaret Silliman intended to retire after her 24 years of dedicated service. So I just wanted to give you a brief intro about me and my qualifications. Um, I'm mostly highlighting the responses that have already been submitted in the League of Women's Voters uh, insert and the uh, Yellow Springs News uh, info about the candidates. So I encourage you to read those uh, fully as well. My name is Gina Gunderklein. Um, I'm born and raised in Yellow Springs. I'm very proud to call this place home and I've worked in uh, and served here in various capacities throughout my life and now raising my son Xander here. For the past 10 years, I've been part-time bookkeeping for many local organizations, uh, often simultaneously, including the Yellow Springs News, Glen Helen, uh, the Yellow Springs Senior Center, the Little Art Theater, uh, Yellow Springs Home Inc., the Presbyterian Church, the Community Children's Center, um, among a few others. I've shadowed the current fiscal officer. Uh, I toured the, our new facility. Uh, engaged in conversations which each, with each of the currently serving township trustees, and I've attended several of the public township meetings. Um, I feel from that that I've developed a good sense of how to best execute the fiduciary responsibilities that are required of the position. Um, I have a wealth of experience assisting in external audits and operating payroll systems for so many of the local organizations, so I feel uniquely suited for the fiscal officer role of the township. I have proved trustworthy, dependable, and have shown a commitment to detail while carrying out these roles. If elected, I will welcome suggestions from community members, encourage more involvement, and strive for complete transparency in budgeting and the financial reporting. My main goal is to be a good steward of the township's resources, and I feel this would be a symbiotic fit. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of questions for you, and so if you'll pass this back and forth. Uh, the first question is, how will you make public information from the township, agendas, minutes, financials, etc., more easily and timely accessible? Do you have a sense of what public information would people would want to have made accessible? Yep. That's the question. Okay. Well, the, the question is how, but, the question, but I'm, my question is like, what types of information do you think would, it would be helpful to have? I mean, the, the budgets, that kind of thing, I imagine is already publicly available, yes? That's no? not for okay. me to, okay. to decide, it's for yeah. what? So, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, I have anything that, that you know, anything that the, um, that the village would require or request to have publicly available. I have a software background. I've made a number of websites myself. It'd be easy for me to throw up a website to make anything public that, um, that the town might want available. Um, yeah, I'm uh, anticipating, of course, this uh, position doesn't begin till April of next year. Um, so if elected, I would anticipate um, using um, the months before that, uh, learning more about the chart of accounts, um, familiarizing myself with the budget, 
and things like that, how to make things available online. I'm not sure what the current protocol is or if it's um, if people are wanting that uh, more quickly than it's become available, but that's certainly something that I would um, work on if, if people are feeling like they don't have access as quickly as they'd like to. Okay. There's another one. I'm not sure it's in your job jar. Should township trustees have term limits? I do not feel comfortable answering that question. Well done. Uh, I think in such a small town, uh, it's easy enough for people to get their name out there if they want to, to, um, to challenge an existing incumbent. Uh, it's, you know, it's a tough job. Being a township officer is a tough job. Um, I mean, I, this is a different question than a fiscal officer. I think that the, our job is not that hard. But I think interfacing with the public uh, and you know, dealing with all of the different opinions that are in this village, um, it's, a, it's a tough job. So I, you know, and, uh, and really an act of service. So if people are willing to stick it out, uh, I don't think we should arbitrarily kick them out a certain number of, after a certain number of years. Um, and I think it's easy enough in a village this size for people to get their name out if they really want to challenge somebody. Uh, that about uh, takes care of the questions I have. All of these are for the uh, next group. Thank you. Let's give them a hand. You do have a couple other elected officials uh, that uh, you'll be voting for. Uh, one of which is a township trustee, but the, he's an incumbent and not a, no a competition in this election, so he has graciously relinquished his time. So, refunded his time to your care. Okay, now we are to the next step. This is the timeline we're on, by the way. And so, if the uh, Candidates for village council will step forward. We will start them. If the candidates for village council will step forward, we'll commence their portion. Again, we will go alphabetical. So if Carmen would uh, come up and again give an introduction of herself and what the issues she sees. I'm Carmen Brown, also known as Carmen Lee. Um, as many of you know, and as many of you are maybe have tired of hearing, I have significant family history in Yellow Springs and in Greene County, spanning some 200 years. My great, great aunt aided in drafting our village charter. I attended school here and was raised by a truly diverse village at that time. A place where everybody counted that was welcoming and open to the lived experiences and points of views of others. A place where we didn't need signs to profess our values. It was understood. And if our neighbor had a divergent opinion, they were afforded the courtesy to hold that opinion without risk of being publicly maligned. I understand our current state of affairs in this world are challenging to say the least, absolutely, but we are as polarized as we've ever been. But in this little blue dot, we don't have to be. It's possible to have discourse without discord. Our village has become increasingly less diverse in every way possible. There's no need to expound. Um, every way means just that. 
there are myriad ways in which we can attempt to curb the homogenization, if that's what we are committed to doing. The two most important things for me um, to work on diligently and tirelessly um, are infrastructure and the development of workforce housing. We have people that work in our shops and restaurants 12, 14 hours, sometimes double shifts, who in the interim have to drive to Xenia, Fairborn, Dayton, or Springfield. They work here, but they can't afford to live here. And we have people who live here and who can afford to live here that don't work here. There's commutes to Columbus and Dayton and Cincinnati, um, sometimes as far as Indiana. And I understand this is not a uniquely Yellow Springs problem, but we are a unique enough village to do the work to take care of, to take care of everyone here. Um, the other part is the infrastructure. My grandfather always said that Yellow Springs was, was piece milled together. And I saw examples of that growing up with him while he was working at YSI and doing fix it jobs in people's houses in town. Um, cast iron stovepipe being used as exhaust for dryers is one of the examples. Um, so it's in critically important that we continue to work on our infrastructure, upgrading as we can, piecing together as we can, and working on a plan to get apartments in the village. Denise Swinger, our ex-zoning uh, administrator, former zoning administrator said during one of our meetings, everyone asked, well, what do you think, Denise? She said, apartments, apartments, apartments. Let's take care of that. If we can take care of that, we're gonna be taking care of, of um, a lot of people who continue to devote so much of their time um, and heart to this village. Thanks. Thank you, Carmen. And now we have Tish. Good evening. Put my eyes on. Hi, I'm Trish Gustafson. Thank you for the time this evening. Um, I've lived in Yellow Springs for 15 years. Oh, am I better? There you go. I've lived in Yellow Springs for 15 years. I'm from Greene County. Um, I'm a mother of two children. My oldest graduated from Yellow Springs. He's in his second year at Wright State University, and my youngest is here. He's 14. And I was raised to be very civically minded. Um, that's just how my, my parents were. And I continued that. Um, in college, I started volunteering for a program called Building Bridges. It was a program that was related to Montgomery County Juvenile Court. I volunteered for 11 years. With at-risk youth, these kids were one step away from being committed to an institution. Um, and it had an, a, about an 85% success rate. So that's something I'm very proud of. It's unfortunately no longer in existence. Um, I was involved in that program until my oldest son was born, Owen. And Owen was born with a rare neurological disease. Um, you probably have seen him driving his red, well, it used to be a red chair, and now it's very slick, black and white, because he's cool. Um, he had to get a new one, but he's all around town. And we moved here specifically for diversity and for accessibility um, in the town, so that he can go up with his peers and you know, hang out just like any other kid. Um, but I grew up in the country, I grew up on a farm, and I was outside if it was you know, 60 below, my dad would kick us out of the house to go play, and Owen did not have that same opportunity. And I recognized that it, about, when he was about three and a half years, it was interesting, it, that had not hit me yet. Um, and so I decided to make a difference. Um, I don't know if you're aware of Owen's place in Beaver Creek. It's located um, a section of Rotary Park, it's seven acres. Um, I founded that when he was four years old. I actually thought I would get it done in three or four years. Um, we finished in 2021, um, but I'm very proud of that. It's a universally designed recreation area. It's for people of all abilities. And that offered a level playing field for him and for people who, um, young people who have disabilities. You know, they just were out there as a kid. You know, they could join their peers. Um, 
and it's, uh, it's very highly utilized in, in Beaver Creek and all of Greene County. Um, as far as professionally, I have 21 years of experience in local government. I worked for Beaver Creek Township. Um, I had my own budget, had to learn fund accounting. Um, I had to attend budget hearings every year. Um, I worked for and with the township equivalent of a village manager. Um, and after working for elected officials, I never thought that I would be standing here tonight <laughs> to be one, but um, I feel like my experience can be of help to our community. Um, and so being a director of human resources, that will help as well, but the fund accounting as well. Um, when I started reading about our budget um, issues within uh, the village, I became very alarmed. That's not something that's um, common in the public sector. I can tell you in 21 years, I only know of one other area that um, had that significant of deficit spending, and that was Xenia Township, and it was just an unfortunate situation where someone was elected and they you know, just were in a little bit over their, their head. Um, I understand now that the finance director um, has indicated that the budget is much better than um, was originally um, forecasted last fall. Um, and that it's not as terrible, but, and that, I mean, I think that's really good news. Um, I think it's progress in the right direction, but we still need to have our annual expenditures more in line with the income. Um, a $1 million deficit is just, that's significant. And I will tell you, from Beaver Creek, I, um, we were in the pink, just barely. We had to cut our budget by 15%, and I personally took a pay cut so that my staff, the, the staff of the township did not have to, um, because it was, it's taken very seriously. Oh, I only have one minute. Um, so I think that uh, we need to work towards balancing our budget. Um, we need to strive towards um, many different priorities in our village, but I know I was asked to, to bring up two that are most important. Um, as Carmen mentioned, um, I have the same thing. I think it's important to bridge the, the divide. It seems increasingly apparent between council and our citizens. Um, I think that we all need to strive to work together. Um, how divisive it is, I think that that's, uh, that's problematic. Um, and I also think that hiring a competent village manager is uh, a very my next priority. Um, we need somebody that's strong experience in housing and economic development issues. Um, and I think that I just, in closing, I think that I have the experience to help with hiring this position with HR and I could save the ten dollars to $15,000 fee for hiring a consultant. So I appreciate everyone being here tonight and listening and hearing all the wonderful candidates. We have, um, you know, all of us um, have diverse experiences. And um, thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tish. And now it is time for Gavin DeVore Leonard. Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks to the McKee Association for hosting. Um, good to see so many folks from around the community here. Um, so um, I grew up in a small town uh, about an hour and a half north of here called Bluffton, um, primarily. My family's uh, five generations or more on both sides from Lima. And um, in, um, in Bluffton, I, I enjoyed growing up there, but I couldn't wait to get out. You know, I was like, when high school was over, I was like, I gotta get out of here. And I went to New York as quickly as I could and then lived in Cincinnati for 11 years, then Columbus for four years. And at some point, I think it was in Columbus when I would go drop my kid off at one place and then go to the grocery 20 minutes from there and go to my house 10 minutes from there and then drive to work 30 minutes from there and I never ran into the same people. Um, I realized that I wasn't really building community and I felt like it was time to get back to the sort of roots of small town living that I really had enjoyed and appreciated and so um, chose to come back um, to a small town but one that was a little bit more progressive a little bit more diverse, um, had more sort of culture and vibrance, and Yellow Springs sort of spoke to me in those kind of ways as somebody who um, affectionately thinks of myself as an Ohio mutt, somebody who's really kind of bounced around the state and um, you know, has uh, a wife and family have done the same. Um, after having now been here for eight years, um, I, I do think this is an interesting and vibrant community. I, I, sometimes I think we're like kind of hard on ourselves. It's, pretty cool, like it's a great place in a lot of ways. 
Um, we have abundant green space. We have a downtown that's full. If you drive around Ohio, you know that that's not common. Um, I think we have a lot of really passionate people. I'll never forget uh, when I was thinking about moving here, looking at the Yellow Springs News and seeing that essentially over 10% of the population had written a letter to the editor, which just as one marker of the level of engagement, I thought was really cool. And I still think uh, I appreciate how much people care about what's going on here. Um, but of course, it's not a panacea. Um, Yellow Springs isn't, uh, in, in many ways, it's not the place that I hoped it would be. Um, and I've, after many years of talking about it and thinking about it with friends, it, um, you know, this opportunity came up. I think hope many of you probably know I was appointed to um, you know, fill Lisa Krieger's spot um, about a year and a half ago. Um, and I've, I, I felt like I you know, would try my best to make a, make a contribution. I've, I've done that. And I, I do feel like there's a real value in continuity um, of having someone who has worked with the staff, who's worked with other council members, and has a sense of how things work. Um, and honestly, I feel a responsibility to keep, um, you know, to, to keep doing this, and that, that hence being here uh, running. Um, you know, Yale Springs has definitely changed. Um, there are some major anchor institutions that are, are different now from the stories that I hear and from the, um, you know, from friends and colleagues that talk about um, the community over time. Um, you know, I think um, we, we've tried to do a lot, I, I think we've tried to do so many things, particularly at the Capital V Village, like the village government, that sometimes I worry that we've kind of lost track of what our top priorities are. And one of the things that's, um, it was cool to hear the first um, folks talking and they're both like, well, if the other one wins, it's cool. And um, you know, I've, I have a lot of respect for the other people up here. And uh, similarly, it's, it's nice to be in a collegial environment where I feel like we actually share very many of the same um, you know, values and interests. So um, you know, now, um, you know, I, I do think that we, we have some work to do around making strategic decisions um, you know, and prioritizing what are the things that we care about, the, the pieces, and it's nice. I, I was looking at one of those papers back there that I had filled in the answers like a month or so ago, and then thankfully I still think the same thing as I did when I read the paper. Um, so I'm, I still think, I think affordability, um, you know, particularly uh, development of affordable housing, um, you know, uh, addressing and consciously thinking about racial diversity and consciously thinking about um, how we make this a community where, um, where young people uh, are interested in being and thriving and that families are, um, you know, are staying here and in um, and, and raising their families here. So I think um, all of those pieces, um, you know, those three pieces all around diversity, I think are the, are the areas where I'd like to continue to, um, continue to focus. So um, 30 seconds left, I think those are the main pieces. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Gavin. And last but not least, Scott Osterholt. We meet again. Okay. My name is Scott Osterholm. I moved here as a junior in high school in 1987. I graduated from Yale Springs High School in 88. Um, I hung around the village throughout the 90s, and I really met a lot of people playing in the adult softball leagues, uh, from Jackie Davenport and her crew to where I went on to play the um, Barb Cousins and Jane King Hamilton, to uh, Curtis Butler and the Simler Boys and all them. Great people showed me a lot and taught me a lot about this village. Um, as of now, uh, I moved back here in 2014. And within a year, I decided that I wanted to get involved. Well, I could either be on the internet like a lot of people are and just throw bombs and gripe and fuss or actually get involved. So I started my first committee. I got on with the Human Relations Committee. And then from there, I got on the committee to find the village manager, which we got his sway. I was on the committee to find the police chief, which got his chief Berg. Currently, I'm on the board of zoning appeals. And in the last couple of years, I've been a proud member of the planning commission. I think we're actually starting to get some move forward. And there's a lot of work we've been trying to get going. 
Um, currently, I'm an employee for Cresco Labs. I'm a packing agent up there. And on every Saturday morning, you can find me because I work a Saturday shift at the E Old Trail Tavern. I'll probably be drinking coffee out there in the morning. I'm very accessible. Um, one of the things about doing all this committee work is I got to learn a lot about how council works and how the system actually, how you get things done. And I also got to learn a lot about our village staff and, for lack of a better word, their team. They are really good people. Um, we've had a changeover from Denise Swinger to uh, Megan Leatherman, who Megan is doing a really good job is in our building department. Um, but learning all this stuff has also helped me keep me up to date on the priorities of the village. Um, and one of them, uh, housing, and just like probably everyone is saying, I'm a big proponent of appointment, uh, apartments. We had a planning commission meeting and we all were asked what our individual goal was, and that is one of my main ones. Um, and that's not just building like a new apartment complex. I'm, you know, if people dividing up their houses if they so wanted to and walling it off. And, you know, when I first moved here, there was many multifamily units, especially right around Mills Lawn. That whole area was like two or three families would be in one house. Um, because the people that work here really, I would really like to see them have a chance to live here. Um, one of the more crucial things that's been brought up is, was brought to me by a, a citizen. She came up to me and she asked me, and she goes, Scott, you're kind of rough around the edges, but you're always who you are. I go, yeah. I go, probably the only difference between, you know, when you catch me at the planning commission meeting or one of the either committees or out in public life is my jokes are probably more PG to G. <laughs> um, I have such a team, I'm very active in the community not only with this, but also with softball. And thanks to the paper, I've got to uh, point out that I'm also the coach of the second place Golds team, which by the way, the final score was 22 to 19. We tried, we just ran out of time. <laughs> um, other than that, I love this community. Um, I came up, when I moved here from Arkansas, I've actually been to Arkansas twice. Once in 1989 and once in 2018 to sell up my father's estate. I never had an interest in going back after I got here. Even when I traveled on the road, doing stained glass restoration and historical window preservation, I always made a point once a year, I always came back to Yale Springs to reconnect with my people. And the trick is when you do something like that, you don't go trying to find everyone. Just go find the ones you always can. And certain places have not changed, the people have changed. The Geo Trail Tavern has changed, but it's still the same. Uh, the winds, it's changed, but at the same time, it's still the same. There's, a, there's that familiar, we can't stop the change. But those of us that remember how it used to be, love the vibe that this town, the gift it gave to me and gave to Carmen as we were gr growing up in our formative years. And uh, on that, I'd just like to let it go and let's go on to questioning. Oh, one more thing, I would like to thank the James A. McKee Association for this. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Now we come to the, f not more of them. I won't get through these. They, yeah. Anybody? We'll sort them. Uh, share the mic. You get one minute to respond. Sure. And I've got some humdingers. I bet you do. <laughs> that your fans have provided. For all the candidates, what are your qualifications for running a multi-million dollar organization? <laughs> okay, well, when I was a foreman for Shenandoah Restorations in South Carolina, we did many of projects that were in the millions of dollars, and I ran all the logisticals of, because when you're on the road and you're away from your home base, you have to plan everything out accordingly. You can't just run back to the office and grab supplies. Um, on that kind of experience, it's really, when it comes down to stuff, it's about logistics, it's about looking down the road, it's also not planning that everything's gonna be perfect. You know, there's always, a, you save something back for a rainy day, or as if anyone's ever had home improvement, they'll call that an addendum, yeah, and I'm sure some of you have gotten hit with those over the years. Um, so that's, that's just some brief stuff, and plus, like I said, 
working on planning commission and looking down the road and just it's very important it's also a humbling experience so oh, no, no, go ahead. Are you sure? yeah, sure. sorry um, at Beaver Creek Township I was part of a team uh, of individuals who ran the township um, and managed the budget so I feel that council is a team as well and Owens Place um, it took uh, almost 16 years to complete, but it was a multi-million dollar project. And um, it started with myself and then another individual jumped on and we did it by ourselves for many years until we grew a committee. So I have that level of experience as well. Did you want to go? Oh, did you want to go? Here you go? I think for me, a mark of intelligence is being able to acquiesce to people who know more than you about certain things. If you're able to do that, then you're, you, you're in good hands. Um, and, uh, you know, I will say last year um, with the fiscal officer that we had, there was some difficulty um, understanding the budget, hard to reach, um, wasn't as adept at explaining um, in ways that are easier for lay folks to understand. But with Amy Kemper, um, all of that has been resolved. We did project that we would have a $3 million deficit. But as of June 30th, 2023, we have an actual gain of $267,000 for the first half budgeted loss though, we budgeted a loss of 3 million. The village has about $11 million in cash on hand as of 9-30, 2023. Um, the reason that we aren't in, in, in a deficit at this point is because there were many um, projects that were stalled or not started, projects that were um, prioritized, and we were able to kind of balance-ish the budget. We're not currently in a deficit. We will probably break even. Um, and all of this information is available on the website. It's in the packets. And if anybody has any question about how we're doing financially, Amy Kemper is um, more than willing to, to speak with anyone and give anyone their time, her time. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to say that. Um, yeah, I, um, I've been running, um, you know, directing uh, small nonprofit organizations for about the last 20 years. Uh, so worked with a lot of budgets and, um, you know, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of qualifications around working with budgets. I also, um, I, I did work on state budget and tax policy for uh, about a decade. Um, so I've spent more time with numbers than I recommend that anyone does. Um, yeah, and then obviously the time on council, um, and I, you know, agree with Carmen. We've got um, got a strong team right now, and it's been really helpful to get information from both people who have been around for a long time and uh, you know new team members. So I feel highly qualified in this way. Okay, here's kind of a long one. While we have our own affordable housing nonprofit organization. Home Inc. in the village, are you receptive to other nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity working with the village to address the housing needs? Are uh, allocating affordable housing funds to additionally support uh, them like you have given to Home Inc.? Are you willing to provide free tap in fees? village land, infrastructure assistance. I'll be the sacrificial lamb. So I, I think it would, I think it would be good to support, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not good at holding this. I think it'd be good to support another group. Um, can you repeat the last part of the question though? Because I think I, I was focusing on the first, I'm sorry. Basically, would you give the same financial considerations to an outside company, such as free tap-in fees on utilities, village land, uh, infrastructure, uh, 
those sort of things, particularly given our budget. That's interesting. So I, I'm not sure because I think that until the finances are, do we have a balanced budget, which um, we can agree to disagree, but um, it's, we are doing deficit spending still. Um, I don't know that we have the resources currently to offer that to another group, um, but I certainly would be willing to think about it once the, you know, our finances are more sound. Um, I think the short answer is sure. Yeah, I mean, open to, um, to, to anybody that helps us meet our goals. I, I think the, the main thing we're doing right now, we've got a housing committee that's getting started. We've got obviously new um, you know, village manager, uh, you know, administration. I think we need to get clear on what our goals are, um, you know, set our goals, and then work on within those goals what the priorities are, and then figure out where our resources go. So yes, we have some questions around what you know, how many dollars do we have to put toward this and how many other um, resources do we have to put toward it? You know, Home Inc., from everything I can tell, has been a great partner, brings lots to our community. Um, but if others can help us, sure. I think we should be open to, to considering other options as well. But I, I have no reason to think that Home Inc. isn't a great partner. Well, I guess I would have to go along with a yes on that, but at the same time, I also would want to be very cautious because while that's a, a great idea, without knowing the added information, like you know, okay, what would they want? You know, and if we're like tapping and giving away land and stuff like that, we'd have to consider our budget where we're at with that, and we wouldn't also want to start something where it's homing versus having every man. I mean, we'd like to be able to do both, not one or the other. Um, that's just kind of what I look at. So that's about as best of answer I can give you right now, to be honest with you. So um, one of the things that the village has that a lot of communities don't who are um, encountering the same difficulties with housing is that the village has land that's really attractive for developers. It's incredibly attractive for federal and state developers. And there's an initiative um, through several entities of the federal government to incentivize um, municipalities investing in minority-owned businesses. The federal government has money available to, um, to give for this, for this cause. Working with Home Inc. versus not, or working with another organization is kind of a question, but not really, because we are going to have to widen our circle. We are going to have to look to the federal government and look to more state agencies for funding for affordable housing, for like Denise said, apartments. And I will go back to what I said from the very beginning. We have, um, we have something that a lot of communities don't, and that is the land. Um, so yes, there's a lot of there's a lot of details to work out, but it is not an impossibility. There are models all over this country, from small towns that work with you know usually mostly on the west coast because they've been dealing with this for a little bit longer. But we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And um, like I said before, our financial information is available on the website. It's in the packet, and Amy Kemper is um, more than willing at any point to talk to anybody about about our budget. Okay, last night, the school board candidates meeting, the question was, would you support preservation of Mills Lawn Green Space as a community park? Everybody said yes. Uh, as candidates for the village council, would you support working with the school board to preserve Mills Lawn Green Space? Well, since that's school property, um, I would be willing to, to work with them if it was initiated by them while it's still their property. Um, I've met with uh, people that are part of this group to keep it green space, and just as I said two years ago, and I said it again this year, is um, it will always be green space as far as I'm concerned. There is nothing in the works as far as I've ever heard even a whisper about even if 
God forbid our schools were to fail and we didn't have that school there no more, it would still remain green space. So yeah, I'm, I, no problem with that. I can't imagine not having a central play area. Um, and I, I support keeping the green space. We actually built an accessible sandbox that was there for a long time so that wheelchairs could drive up and still be able to play. Um, I'm sure it's fallen apart, but um, it's, it's so centrally located. It's highly utilized by our school children and people that come in from out of town. And I just think it's, it's the central heart of the downtown. So I definitely would support keeping it. Yeah, I met with um, a group of folks about this. I, I think the short version is um, kind of like Scott said. I don't. It depends on what our role is, but to the extent that it's you know that it's a conversation that we're part of, I I think it's a you know a good idea to maintain. Um, I, if anything, I'd like to see us figure out how to invest more. Um, you know, the, it gets a lot of. I live just down the street. I feel like it gets a lot of use during the school day when it's the right time of year, but then most of the rest of the time there's not too much use so i think it could get more use um you know I, I do think the conversation has become a little bit oversimplified you know around the way that the conversation was related to the school levy so i guess i'll just say um might not be popular but the the dynamic i think is is that we're trying we were trying to figure out how collectively in our community to address affordability with the uh, affordability in town and then also address uh, the schools, the need to invest in, uh, in school buildings. And so I think that's where the conversation came from. So it's, I think it's trying to figure out how do we, um, you know, how do we do all the things we want in our community. I definitely would like to see the green space maintained, but I also think we need to figure out how we, um, you know, how we use our, uh, use our resources wisely. So there are some, some people here in the audience and some people who are listening at home who remember things like Shakespeare in the Park, um, softball. I mean, when I was growing up here, there were maybe 2,000 more people, so there are more kids, and that space was used all the time. One of the things that I will say about the history of this space is that it was never segregated. This is critically important in Greene County, Ohio. I'm sorry, it just is. Um, this is a place where my grandmother and one of her very best friends, uh, who happens to be a woman by the last name Morgan, were able to come and bring their children together to play together in Ohio in the early 40s in Greene County um, versus you know, places like Enon being not, not on the books of, as a sundown town. Fairborn, not on the books as a sundown town, but a sundown town. So Mills is important, it's beautiful, and, and all of those things, but the historical significance is, is immense. And we all need to keep that in mind um, as well. We'll stay with the uh, school. Uh, if the, here's the one. If the school levy doesn't pass, how do you foresee that impacting the village and how would the village council, you react as a member of village council to counter that? I don't, I, so I, you know, I don't deal in ifs. I, I can't. If, if was the fifth, we'd all be something. Um, speculation about where we're going to go, how council's gonna be impacted by the passing of a levy or not. Um, you know, the, the crossing bridges when we come to it is, is a part of my philosophy because what happens when you speculate is you, there, there comes that divisiveness again. There comes that thing that we don't need again, creeping in and causing a lot of vitriol and, and, and grief between neighbors. So I, that's about as deep as I'm gonna get on that, and that was pretty deep. <laughs> <sighs> okay, uh, could you repeat the question again so I make sure I understand yeah. it completely? Assuming the levy doesn't pass, what is the impact do you foresee on the village, and how would the council that you were a member of uh, react to that impact uh, and 
consequences. Okay. Um, as far as reaction by the village, um, I'm not going to get into that because it's going to go either way. Some people are for it, some people are against it. So I'm not going to touch that part of it. But I will say, as far as a reaction, we've already started a reaction. I'm not talking about council, but part of the workers on planning commission is like we're trying to get more apartments. One of the things that would help is if we had more people here. So our solution is actually more of a time thing. It's not an immediate thing. And you know that's kind of the way we got to go because, like she said, we had you know a few thousand, you know, thousand plus people more back when we were younger, and that's true. We also had a, you know a vibrant Antioch going on, which we don't have anymore. So, really, it's about getting places to where maybe people can live here and you know have families here and get more kids locally in the school instead of importing. Thank you. I think that it would impact. Um, neighbor to neighbor more than it would directly impact um, council initially. Um, and I agree, I think it's, um, that's a, it's a hot topic and it's, it's divided people. Um, and I just hope that regardless of whether it passes or not, that as a community we can start mending those fences and working together um, because it's, it, um, yeah, it just, it depletes um, so much um, of our of our village sentiment, and it's it's a, people that come in from out of town are even feeling it. Um, I've heard it from friends before, so um, that's. Well, I guess I'll start and say I do hope people will support the levy. Um, I I feel like it's significant that there was a compromise position that was reached uh, after you know significant you know discussions, um, and so I you know. I, really honor all the work that, um, you know, school board and many other uh, folks did, uh, you know, for our community. And I, I am nervous about the sort of divisiveness in our, you know, in the community. And I, I do think it impacts village council too. Um, you know, we've had a couple of, a uh, couple, few really good conversations, I think, with the other taxing entities, the township um, and the school board. Um, and I think those conversations need to continue. There's, um, you know, we are all interrelated. Uh, all, these, all these pieces do fit together. So when there's a problem in one area, it, it does impact others too. Um, so yeah, I, ho I hope that we can, I hope we can move past it. Okay. okay. What are your uh, thoughts regarding the permanently filling the village manager's position, criteria, uh, process. That. You got the bike. <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, if you've watched any of the council meetings, you'd have a sense. I, I, I feel like I'm still thinking about it. I, it it's not totally straightforward. Um, you know, there have been processes done in the past that have that have had. Um, you know, different outcomes. We've worked with firms in the past. We've done internal processes. They both have costs and capacities associated with them. Um, there are real values to the continuity of having, you know, leadership continue. Um, there are, you know, some gaps that we have to fill, I think, in terms of being able to work toward our goals. So it's a, it's not a simple, there's not a simple answer. I, I think I'm still open-minded. Um, look forward to you know the continued conversations, and we did ultimately decide that we were going to wait until after these elections, and then have a conversation as a group to make a final decision. I don't I don't feel like I'm you know dead set one way or the other. So when I've worked previously in hiring that level of a position, um, I have used committee based um, hiring because I feel like you learn more about the candidate when they're sitting in front of different groups of people. So we have done in-house interviews. Um, we've had a stakeholder, you know, members of the chamber, and then a third interview with members from the community. Um, it's, it's just interesting, um, and I, I do write a behavioral-based process typically, but it's interesting to see how an individual presents um, among those different groups. And I think that um, that would be that would give us the best picture, especially when it's somebody from outside of here that is you know, not somebody that's really known, um, to get to know them as best as possible before an offer is made. Well, as someone that's actually been on one of these committees to find a village manager, um, 
I don't want to think the process needs to be as big as it was the last time we did it. It was very time consuming and a lot of money. And But I think we can do a minimal national search um, or whatever's required. And uh, and also, I also like the way we did it, it is where we had a group of citizens together to start off and we went through all these um, resumes and everyone got to pick something and we kind of just kind of narrowed it down and after a few meetings we got it narrowed down. And uh, we ended up with Josue. Although I did like this one lady from Alaska because I wanted, I would love to see the papers say they brought doom to Yellow Springs because that was her last name. <laughs> Not to get all philosophical, but there, you know, having worked briefly with the former village manager and now the interim village manager, I'll say this. And also what I've noticed in the demographic of Yellow Springs changing over time. We have a lot of very high thinkers, people with very good ideas. Um, people with ideas who have ideas that are better than anybody else's ideas or equal to as excellent and beautiful as the person's ideas before. So this is a thing that we have and I don't have anything against this, against this thinking, but what happens is we get stuck and we've kind of run out of doers. There's an environmental writer who wrote about it, and I don't remember his name right now, but what a balance is, is someone that is a thinker who is able to delegate, who is able to loosen up on the reins, to let the people that are responsible for doing their jobs do their jobs. Someone who is a leader who's also able to delegate and has faith in their staff that they're gonna do exactly the right thing for the village, there's that thing. And then there's the getting things done thing. Um, meetings upon meetings upon meetings, ad nauseum, um, gets us stuck in this gridlock and we're kicking the can down the road um, right now, the interim, um, with the interim village manager, we have someone that is a thinker and a doer, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good balance right now. I'll think about the other stuff in the future. That'll be the bridge that I cross when I get to it. I only have the capacity for, for right now. <laughs> okay, uh, what are the most important actions the village and council can take to increase revenue in a sustainable, long-term way? Well, for one, it'd be nice if we could get another industry to come in on the CBE land, or one of, one of our private people that's working on this to get some in there too, into their places. Um, that would be a big goal, because one of the things that, uh, really also hindered Yell Springs was, you know, 30 years ago, you know, we still had Antioch Book Plate, we still had Vernays, YSI, which pays more than Xylem. Um, we're going here, so that's why we had a lot of people who lived here, worked here, raised their kids here. Well, they all, those are all gone. And up until 2019, when Cresco opened its doors, that's the first industry to come back here to Yell Springs. That's almost a 30 year without. So I really think, you know, getting, a, getting another industry on the CBE would be great for us in the long term. Can you repeat the question, please? It's around here someplace. Uh, what is the one thing the village can do to increase revenues in a sustainable, long-term way? I think it goes back to hiring the right village manager. Um, I think we need someone who is strong in economic development um, and that, you know, you can't guarantee how long they're gonna stay in the community, but if we could get, you know, five to eight year commitment out of somebody, I think that that would go a long way towards um, increasing those monies. Well, I, First, I think we need to decide what we need revenue for. I'm not, I, the premise of sort of, 
I don't think we need revenue necessarily. I think we have things that we'd like to spend on, but I don't think we've yet decided. And I think we have a we have particularly an affordability question that I think we're trying to address, you know, big picture in the community. So I don't I don't I don't know if I <laughs> would start with we have to. Um, and then I don't I don't think there's one. I mean, the one if if there was one, the one that I I guess I would like to try to figure out is there any way to get uh, revenue from the large number of people who visit here, um, and um, and so I think you know parking is one of those options. It's not as simple. It requires some conversation. I think residents should be exempt. I think we can figure out how to um, create balance for you know downtown businesses. But that is something I think is worth considering. There's a lot of people who come and you know uh, are in our community but aren't uh, contributing much to it. You know, we, we don't have a lot of control over sales tax and other components, but uh, that, that is one thing I think you know, is worth looking into if we need revenue. Okay, would you support inclusionary zoning? I, you got one more? Well, I'm gonna answer. Oh, it's, it's gonna be fine. quick. It's gonna be quick. Um, how do we make ourselves attractive to small businesses? How do we make ourselves attractive to small businesses in tech? Um, it'd be really great to have a, a, a business move onto the CBE land or businesses come into town. We don't have any housing for anybody. Um, we have housing for maybe possibly CEOs or will, but we don't have any houses. We don't have any workforce housing. So, and we it's going to be imperative that we work on that to attract businesses to employ pe where people are going to stay it's just going to be it's going to re revenue but people are still in fairborn or xenia or springfield um that's just that's just my quick take on it um and kind of going back to what scott said you know the, before we did have these small businesses that employed a lot of people and um now we don't, so what do we do to make ourselves attractive? Um, what, do we, what do we have to do <laughs> to make ourselves attractive for these smaller tech companies that are attached to the larger tech companies that are coming? All right, I'm done. Okay, here's one. Being elected is tough from ha handling high expectations to maximizing limited resources. How do you cope with the stress to fulfill your role in the best in this capacity? I go to work at Cresco and I pack marijuana all day long. <laughs> in all honesty, if stress is gonna eat you up, this isn't what you should get into. I actually do this because I enjoy it, because I like, I come from a family that always encouraged uh, debate with each other. You, you know, back when all families used to be split, Republican, Democrat. Every now and again, you know, that one cousin, well, he's independent or she's, you know. Um, but it's really, if, if you got stress, this isn't your thing. Um, I enjoy it. Um, yes, I have good days, there's bad days. You gotta have a thick skin. Um, because, you know, but the key is, though, if you do get elected, or even if you do committee work, you get sworn in before you get sworn at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. That's funny. So, when I first started working in the public sector, I, I had thin skin. It took a long time. Um, you know, I wanted, I was human resources, and um, it, it was very hard for me to separate you know, being liked from doing my job. But now I just, I come from a standpoint, I just try to do the best that I can. Um, I like to take a lot of feedback from people. I don't have all the right answers. I don't know everything. Um, but I like to hear from other people and use that to help formulate my decisions. And um, it, it can be very stressful, but um, I've learned that it's not personal. You know, again, like we're all just doing the best that we can in the position that we have. I, de I mean, I think I agree with Scott that if you if you get really worked up about this, it's probably not the best place to be. Um, uh, and I do appreciate there's so many people that that's like maybe the main thing people come up. People say, "Well, are you, how do you deal with it?" I, I de you know I just don't take it too personally and take lots of walks in the Glen and you know 
talk it out with your colleagues. And it's also like, you know, I, I don't know, I'm passionate about this stuff. Sometimes I get worked up, but then you get back down, it's okay. Um, so I don't know, just basic mental health maintenance. <laughs> Okay, I think we've pretty much done our 30 minutes. One more? Oh, yeah. yeah. I keep... I know. I, I, you start with the... And then you pass it on. Oh, that's what you Precisely. It gives me time to ruminate. Um, so, I think that for me, we have parameters on how we're supposed to you know, how we're supposed to, I don't want to say behave because that's not right. Um, the the um, charter, um, the constitution, they, they give us parameters on, how, on what we can do and what we can't do. And so for me, I just, um, what I can't do, I can't do. And what we can't do as a body, we can't do. Um, and the other piece of this is that I'm, you know, I don't know, I don't know what part of it is nostalgia poisoning for me or what part of it is knowing we, how great we are as a community still and this is something that can never be erased that I want to champion for this place and, or, or what. But, um, you know, it's like to have the opportunity to engage in this way um, has been critically important for me and has, has um, has changed changed me for the better, and I refuse to give up on on us. I mean, that, okay, that's it. That's it. Okay, I think we've done our thirty minutes. Probably exhausted this group. Let's give them a round of hand. Okay, some of the materials have been a little confused. Do you vote for three of these or two of these? The Board of Election even is confused because I've got my absentee ballot and it says vote for two. So I think I'm going to be getting a new ballot. But uh, I, I think because of being appointed, you have to run the next time it comes and that's kind of skewed the numbers. Typically, we'd vote for two, one year, and three the next. No. Always, three. Always, three. Always three. Oh, okay. I was trying to read the elected official and when their things apply. Somebody gets the short one, right? Right. Right. Okay, so you get to be three of the four. It's a two. Okay. Did that muddy, muddy it up? Yeah, but I think it got brought back, so that was good. Okay. Had help from the audience. Anything else? Let's give them a round of applause for putting it out. Okay, thank you for coming. It's, I'll uh, refund a couple minutes to your life.